Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the Network of the National Library of Medicine's Resource Picks session. And today we're going to be talking with Stephen Greenberg, who is with the NLM's History of Medicine Division. And he'll be talking about the fabulous research collection that the he has and that um, NLM has of rare medical materials. Um, before we get started, I just want to let everybody know we are recording this session and it will be available on our uh, web page for the training session and I will send that out to everybody that registered. Um, so feel free to share that information with colleagues who didn't have a chance to attend today. So a little bit about Stephen Greenberg. He has uh, worked in the History of Medicine Division at the U.S. National Library of Medicine since 1992, where he's currently the head of rare books and early manuscripts section. His research and publications span a number of fields, including the history of printing and publishing, the social history of medicine, the history of medical librarianship, and the history of medical photography. He is the past chair of the Medical Library Association History of the Health Sciences section and past president of the Archivist and Librarians in the History of the Health Sciences. He has lectured and taught nationwide and currently is an adjunct professor at both Catholic University of America and the College of Library and Information Studies at the University of Maryland, where he lectures on the history of the book. He has received many distinguished uh, awards, and uh, we are very happy to have him be with us today. So I will turn everything over to Stephen, and let me get you to where you need to be, and we'll get started. Okay. So, you know, the nice thing about doing this on WebEx, so I can see all those names of people that I know, so hi. Nice to see you all. Um, so most of you have probably seen pictures of the mothership, as we used to call the place. Um, but it's a nice place to start, since a lot of this will have to do with both the history of NLM and our collections as well. So here we are. Got to have a title slide, right? So I don't have to tell you folks that NLM is the world's largest library, but sometimes our history gets to be kind of fun um, because we were founded more or less in 1836 as the Army Medical Library. And these three gentlemen have some role in the creation of the library. My personal favorite is Thomas Lawson in the middle because he's got the best hat, okay? But Joseph Lovell was the first Army Surgeon General, founded the Army Medical Corps in 1818. And then you have Lawson who was Surgeon General, and then Lawson was on medical leave. And so the acting Surgeon General of the Army in 1836 was a guy by the name of Benjamin King. And I should remind you folks that when I talk about the Army Surgeon General, this is not the same as the Surgeon General for the Public Health Service, two different positions. Okay, but the thing about King, which makes him kind of fun, is this little totally unreadable document from the 12th of November, 1836. This is in the National Archives, by the way. And it's a letter from King to the Secretary of War asking for money for the, um, the Army Medical Corps. And he was asking for a total of $2,400 for the calendar year 1837, of which $1,150 was for the salary of the clerk, $700 for a messenger, $400 for posting materials back and forth, and then the last line item, medical books for the office, $150. That was the first time 
the Army Medical Corps asked for money to buy books to keep on site in the Surgeon General's office. And they kept them here in the old Riggs Bank building. Now, if you were standing in front of this site and you turned around, you'd see the White House. And basically, the Army rented the top floor on the right of this picture to store their books. And, and that is where we start. That is where we start gauging our history. So some of these books that we call rare books now, we bought them when they were new. So the Army Medical Library collection remained quite small until 1865, when this thing called the Civil War was at its, was beginning to wind down. And it was decided that all the books that had been collected needed a more permanent location and a more permanent curator. So the gentleman in the middle is the Army Surgeon General. This is his staff. And the gentleman that I put in that nice little oval is a guy by the name of John Shaw Billings. So we moved out of the Riggs Bank building in 1866, and we moved into, of all places, Ford's Theater. Um, Ticket sales kind of did a downturn after that really bad production of our American Cousin in 1865. And the Army moved its collection of medical books and also medical artifacts into the building. Now, libraries and theaters are built the same way. And the weight of the book stack was literally tearing the building apart. And this gentleman, Joshua Billings, now a little grown up, was in charge of the question, said, we need a building that's built like a library, OK, that will hold the weight of the book stack, that will have proper facilities for reading and preserving the books. And this is what you um, might call the beginnings of the Index Medicus because it was decided that the library needed not just to collect materials, but to index them, not just by author and title that had been done forever, but by subject. And this is a picture of Billings at home after dinner over port and cigars indexing various journals as they came into the library. And Billings, really early on, this is 1876, very early on, Billings said, you know, the Library of Congress doesn't do medicine. They leave it to us. We need to be a resource well beyond just being a resource for the Army. And he is asking the Congress in 1876 to provide the money to have a, a catalog of what he was calling the National Medical Library which could be sent out in volumes around the country and around the world. And of course, we weren't officially called the National Library of Medicine until 1957. We were the Army Medical Library, the Surgeon General's Library, the Armed Forces Medical Library. <coughs> Excuse me. But already, Billings was thinking in terms of the National Medical Collection in 1876. And he got the money, more or less. And so there were two publications that the Army began in 1879-1880. The one that you're seeing on the left, the Index Medicus, is the one that grows up to be Medline and now PubMed. And the publication on the right is the Index Catalog of the Library of the Surgeon General's Office, U.S. Army. The index catalog was a US Army publication, but the index medicus was not. So let me explain a little bit about the differences here, because this really influences how we still handle our, our historical materials. 
So index catalog was books, pamphlets, selected articles, and journal titles. It was kind of a hodgepodge. Index Medicus was entirely different because when they began the index catalog in 1880, Billings staff said, Dr. Billings, Dr. Billings, how are we going to keep up? They figured it would take 10 years. It actually took 15 to go through the first series of the index catalog all the way through. So if you had published an article about aardvarks two years after the A to B volume came out, you're going to have to wait 10 to 15 years before it got indexed. So Billings said, well, hey, that's easy. We'll just select a handful of journals that we trust, and we'll index them cover to cover. We still do that. We don't have a couple of army docs telling us which ones to do. We have LISTRIC, the Literature Selection Technical Review Committee, which recommends what journals we should be indexing. So as time passed, Index Medicus became more important than the Index Catalog. The Index Catalog stopped publication in 1961, though they had a 10-year backlog at that point. So the last citation in Index Catalog was actually 1951. But Index Medicus keeps on going, and Listrick keeps on meeting. The other thing I should point out, if you look at the publisher, in the Index Medicus volume on the bottom, it's a private New York publisher. Index Medicus was not a government document the way Index Catalog was, which led to some amusing things because for a long time, Index Medicus and Index Catalog used different indexing terms. And if you're interested in um, pursuing this a little bit more deeply, um, Patricia Gallagher and I wrote an article that is available through PubMed Central um, about the differences between the two. So if you just look me up in PubMed Central or look up Pat, um, you can find that article. And it's PubMed Central, so it's free full text. It's like, yay. So this was Billings' other pride and joy. He finally got a building that was built to be a library. It was opened in 1888. It's gone now. It's, it was on the mall where the Hirshhorn Gallery is now. And it was quite a building. See these structures on the top here? These are skylights. There was no artificial light in the library when it was opened. Here's an inside shot. No artificial lighting, because artificial lighting would have meant gas light, and they didn't really want to burn the place down. There was also, by the way, no indoor plumbing. Um, it is, seems to be that the old red brick building was the last government building in Washington, D.C., to have an outhouse. You heard it here first. And I'm going to go back for just one second. You'll notice that there are two halls here, one on each end. One was the Army Medical Library. The other was the museum. The museum got split off eventually and is now the National Museum of Health and Medicine. They're still part of the Army, but we are not. So this building had its problems as well. So in 1959, ground was broken for the current NLM building. For those of you who know something of the library's history, the gentleman here is Frank Bradway Rogers of the Rogers Award, who was the last Army officer to be our director and our first civilian director. So they moved us up to Bethesda in a building that was, again, state of the art for its time. And here's a view on opening day of the rotunda of the library. And that's the card catalog. 
the building was literally built around the central courtyard that would have the card catalog, which is gone. Um, I should also mention that even in times of COVID, we are in the midst of a major renovation of the physical spaces of the library. So um, when we finally open, this space will become the main, actually the only combined reading room, and all the other spaces are being repurposed. And let me tell you something, renovating a, a 1962 vintage building these days, that's a challenge. So when you think of the history of medicine division, you think of lots of old, rare books. And yeah, we do that. So I'm going to pick a, just a couple to show you right now. Um, this is actually kind of one of my favorites. You know, having favorite books is like having favorite children. We all deny it, but we all do. Um, this is from the 16th century. And it's a guest book from a scientist who had his friends come and visit. And whenever they did, he, they signed his little book. And the person who's holding this is our conservator, Holly Hero, and she's not a big woman. This book is really, really tiny. It is hand done on paper with vellum covers. And this is one that we actually just purchased quite recently. Um, it's an articella. Now, an articella is a medical textbook from the, really from the 13th to the 16th century. And think, think back when you were in your freshman year in college and you had, you know, the Norton Guide to English Literature, or maybe you had in your history class a book of two pages from every work of history that was ever written. Okay, a compilation of the greatest hits you all should know. And that's what an articella is. It's a little bit of Aristotle, a little bit of Plato, a little bit of Hippocrates and Galen, a rather bigger chunk of Avicenna, more correctly, Ibn Alcina. And what makes this one kind of nice, and this is from the 1480s, what makes this one kind of nice is that it's not in Latin, which is the language you would expect. It's not in Greek. It's in Catalan. So Catalan is the language of Catalonia, capital Barcelona. It is not a standard, that's with big air quotes, dialect of Spanish. It's not Latin. It's not French. So it's kind of in the middle there. And this is at a point when the future of Catalonia was very much in doubt. Spain had not yet been unified by Ferdinand and Isabella, and there was still considerable question as whether Catalan, which remained independent, would join with France or join with Spain. And that was something that is still kind of up in the air. Okay, so here's a moment when the medical school in Barcelona is showing its independence by writing standard texts, not in the language of the day, which would be Latin for learning, but in their own native. And it's really quite lovely, by the way. Um, none of these things, you know, we did try a whole lot of stuff, of which more in a, in a little bit, but it's still not quite the same as having the book in your hand. So here's um, some of you may be familiar with the NLM's um, um, Visible Human Project from a couple of years ago. So this is a little older. These are anatomical drawings handwritten in a Persian book from about 1390. Now, <coughs> excuse me, um, books in Arabic and Persian from this time period are rarely illustrated because Basically, it was that Ten Commandments thing about not making graven images. And the books in Arabic are really never illustrated in this era, but the Persian books are occasionally. 
And the theory here was, well, this is so stylized, it's not really a person. So that's how they get away with it. And again, it's hand done, so the calligraphy can go anywhere you want. And while this looks very, very simplified and, and almost crude, when you read the accompanying text, you realize these folks knew an awful lot more about anatomy and physiology than they were able to show in, um, in their diagrams. And again, it's manuscript, it's handwritten. While there are multiple copies, no two of them are the same because it's hand done. And here's a fun book. This is from 1491. It's the Avicenna Canon, printed in Venice in Hebrew. At a time when a Jew could not own a printing shop, so the, the type had to be designed and cast and imprinted by Christian printers. It is the oldest Hebrew language printed medical book. It's in three volumes. And it's big. It's a folio volume. This is about 18 inches, a little bit higher than that. And of course, this is one of our interesting little conundrums. We run into this with books in Hebrew and Arabic and Persian. The book reads, obviously, from right to left. But the scanning software wants to scan things left to right. So we have to reprogram the scanners in order to get this right. Now, this is kind of a, one of the goofier bits of our collection. During World War II, much of the, and we were still down on the mall in the red brick building, and much of our collection was moved to Cleveland for the duration of the war to make sure that German submarines did not sail up the tidal basin and burn Washington and destroy the books. And when the books were in Cleveland, I guess they figured that the Germans had no interest in going to Cleveland. Um, I'm not going to get involved in that. I don't want any Cleveland librarians to be mad at me. But while the books were in Cleveland, we did a lot of rebinding that was state of the art back then, but you would never do that now. And early bindings, you know, 14th, 15th, 16th century bindings, between the leather and the stiffener of the board, they put scraps of paper, whatever they could find kicking around the print shop, to soften it up to give it a little bit of a body and to make sure that the wooden board didn't cut through the leather. When we took the bindings off in Cleveland, our curator, Dorothy Shulian, took the boards home, soaked them apart in her bathtub, and if there was a recognizable piece of, of um, manuscript or printed material in there, she brought it back and cataloged it. And it's called our bathtub collection. And you can really search Locator Plus, NLM's online public access catalog, under bathtub, and you find these. Uh, we're actually now getting involved in a project that's being run out of the Netherlands called the Fragmentarium, where we're going to be putting up digital copies of these. Um, we have thousands of, of bits. And this is a real crowdsourcing kind of a project, because we don't know necessarily what books these come from. Sometimes it's from the book that is actually being bound, but more often it's not. So we're kind of you know, trying to crowdsource to figure out what some of these things actually are. NLM is an international collection. Um, we don't have as much Chinese, Japanese, Korean, African materials as we would want, but we're trying to get more. So this is actually a recent purchase. This is a wooden block from which a Japanese pharmaceutical ad would be printed. So it's the Japanese characters. It's in reverse because you'd be printing this like a big rubber stamp. And this is from about 1910. And this is about, oh, 20 inches along the long end. So it's kind of fun. By the way, if you think scanning early Arabic, Persian, and Hebrew books is fun, you should try scanning Japanese, Chinese, and Korean books. 
the scanners go nuts. And we have a manuscript collection as well. This is actually a close-up, and let's see if this is going to work right. Oh, okay, maybe not. Okay, um, this is a close-up of a chart that won this guy his Nobel Prize. It is the first time that anyone actually mapped out an entire DNA molecule. And you can see the amino acids going down here along the bottom. The codons will be on this side. Um, this chart's kind of big. This is just a detail of it. And it is a conservation horror story, because basically it is six pieces of laboratory notebook paper taken out of Marshall Nuremberg's notebook and scotch taped together. You can kind of see the scotch tape along here. The, scot the, the paper is acidic. The scotch tape is even worse. You can't take the tape off because he wrote on top of the tape, along with the rest of his staff. But still, it's worth a Nobel Prize. And we do have the Nuremberg papers in our collection at NLM, plus we have the Nobel Prize. So in case you've never seen one, this is what a Nobel Prize looks like. And you notice there's some little dents over here in Mr. Nobel's head. By the way, the prizes are all the same uh, on the front. They put your name on the back. Remember that for when you win your own. So the little dents, um, and there's one on his shoulder. So I'm a historian, right? I've got that degree as well as my library degree. And when someone tells me a goofy story, I want independent verification. And I've heard this story from three independent sources, including Dr. Nuremberg's widow, so maybe it's, it's even the truth. But we'll give it a shot. Nuremberg was a really kind of a modest guy. And he kept the um, medal in, in his desk. And when people came to see it, he say, hey, you've seen one of these? And he'd flip it to them. So a Nobel medal is about three inches in diameter. And it's about a, oh, maybe a quarter of an inch thick. And it's you know, almost solid gold. It's 23 carat. And somebody dropped it. And it dented. And they don't give you new ones if you mess it up. So there you go which only goes to show if you win your own Nobel Prize, be careful. Don't drop it. Not everything is quite so serious. Um, one of the things that we've collected over the years are postcards. And we purchased a collection from a man named Michael Wordling a few years ago um, of postcards on the subject of nursing. Now, these are a little weird because Swerdling had some particular um, interests in the nursing postcards. And he was particularly interested in the genre of postcard. And this was very popular during World War I and World War II. that worked on the idea that injured soldiers would get better if their nurses were prettier. So there's a lot of postcards that work on what we would now call that meme, which is like, objectionable at so many levels, but there you go. And this will give you some sense of what's going on. So this is a public health care nurse in Great Britain you know, driving around to her rounds on her motorcycle. And then you've got, and this one is, is 1918, it's right during the war. So she's the spirit of democracy. And this is um, a calendar postcard. Both have all been digitized. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. We have historical order of visuals as well. Um, we have a large and active film collection. And when we are permitted to do so, and this is largely a copyright question, we do stream things out. So for example, here's a film from 1945 on what we would now call post-traumatic stress disorder, but that, back then they were calling a combat fatigue irritability. And since this was produced by the United States Navy, and therefore it's in the public domain, you can stream this right from our website. And for all you movie buffs, 
If the gentleman on the right looks a lot like Gene Kelly, it's because it is Gene Kelly. He directed, he performed, but he's not named because he said, this isn't about me. So this is the NLM Digital Collections homepage. And by the way, I have a slide, the last slide, with all the links that I'll be showing you in the next couple of slides. And since the slides will be available, you can grab them from there. So all of our digital collections can be found in the one site here. And you simply pick the format and your search term. You can look for still pictures or motion pictures, print materials. And if it's here in this site, you can download it. Now, there are some items for which the copyright is unclear. But you know, fair use allows you to download for personal study. But by and large, this is all public domain stuff, and you can have a whole lot of fun. Um, our scanning has slowed down, obviously, because we're not allowed to go into the building to do it. But it's an ongoing process. And there's a lot of really cool stuff here. So this is a series of, uh, this is a screenshot from Digital Collections, obviously. And I'm looking for a particular book, which is a what we would now call a mortality and morbidity report from the Great Plague of London in 1665. And what I was looking for is London's Dreadful Visitation, the first one. So I just did a search for one of the authors, Up This Comes, and then the next one. You see the thumbnail record with some details. You'll notice it says the National Library of Medicine believes this item to be in the public domain because, right, it's from 1665. And you can both view the book and download the book. And the, there are several different formats. If you want to read it, there's a PDF. There's an OCR version. There's even Dublin Core, if you care. Um, archivists do. And the interface is really kind of nice. This is what it would look like. Um, and yeah, this is an interesting moment in the history of public health, you might say. This is something that I've actually done a, a fair amount of work on. Um, because what does one do in the early modern period to figure out how to respond to a plague? Is this a public health issue? Is there something that you can do? You know, I mean, they had no idea about the rat flea vector, OK? But is there something you can do about it? Or is this God's visitation on you being a wicked people, you know, the Sodom and Gomorrah approach? And that's very much an issue here. By the way, I see you about how fun to catalog all this cool stuff. Um, we have two full-time catalogers in the History of Medicine Division and some indexing support as well. And the subject headings um, are different because, you know, you can't really call William Harvey a cardiologist. It doesn't quite work. Plus, um, again, for the cataloging thing, you get a lot of information that is copy specific because this is so much hand done that two books that are supposed to be the same really are not. So that gets to be a real, a real challenge. And fun if you like being a cataloger. And we're digitizing, as I said. But sometimes the format can be a bit of a challenge. So here you've got um, an obstetrics book from the middle of the 18th century and the scanned version. But here's the deal, OK? That little thing over to the lower left, that's not an iPhone. That's an 11-inch iPad, OK? That book is big. It is full size. And it is full size not just to make the pictures more striking, but there's a political message here. This is the point in history when the male gynecologists and obstetricians, they didn't call themselves that yet, but they're trying to take over childbirth 
from the midwives. So they're producing these big, fancy books with these very accurate but really depersonalizing illustrations. I mean, this is an engraving. Okay, so the fact that the book is so big is just as much a political statement where they're basically beating the midwives over the head with what they can do. And as much as I like scanning, you don't get that part of the story if you're just looking at it on your cute little iPad. So resources in the history of medicine from the National Library of Medicine. First of all, you should always consider PubMed because PubMed can go back a lot farther than you think, especially if you're dealing with things from the PubMed Central. So for example, here is a bunch of articles about Ignat Semmelweis published in 1942, free full text in PubMed Central. And there are other articles, you know, it gives you the same similar article kind of a thing. So if there are journals that are in PubMed Central all the way back, and you know how that works, okay, it's going to be free full text. And this one is from the Bolton of the Medical Library Association, as it was called in 1942. So there's a lot of full text historical articles and a ton of secondary materials in the history of medicine right there in PubMed, free full text. And your search strategies will be the same. Now, I mentioned the index catalog before. A few years ago, um, we digitized the entire index catalog series which is 63 volumes between 1879 and 1961. Now, this is bibliographic information. It does not link to full text. And the controlled vocabulary is kind of like, you've got to be kidding me, because they changed it constantly. So when you're searching this, you are searching basically keywords. But that's OK, because the database is fast enough and the search engine is good enough that you can narrow it down. So go full text. Um, you'll see over on the left, it says you, you see the different series dates, OK? So series one took them 15 years to do, and then they kind of got even slower than that until series four and series five were never actually completed, OK? But again, you find books. You find, <coughs> excuse me, you find dissertations. You find all sorts of things that you do not find anywhere else, by which I mean in no other database. And if it's in Index Cat, the library almost certainly still owns it, because we didn't get rid of things. Now, you'll see another little tab there that says ETK, EVK. That is something that was put into IndexCAT when it was created um, kind of as um, a little extra teaser. They are two highly specialized databases of inkippets. OK, inkippets belong to books from the early printed era Remember, Gutenberg more or less invents printing in 1450, but it's really books before 1500. They don't have title pages. They don't have titles. So for many years, books in Latin or the vernacular languages, English, German, French, Spanish, the first sentence of the book would be, here begins this. So the first lines of the book of Exodus would be Incipit Liber Exodus. Here begins the book of Exodus. And catalogers used Incipits instead of standard titles. And what ETK and EVK are are databases of medical Incipits. One is in Old English, technically it's Middle English, or in Latin. So 
it's a unique database in the sense that um, we worked it out with the University of Missouri with some scholars there. It is unique for us because it will index things that we don't actually own, but we do link to uh, libraries that do. So if you got a patron, or if you yourself are interested in really early medical books, EDK, EDK will help you find your way around. That's about as niche as we get, but that's pretty niche. Two other databases that may be of some use to you. The Director of History of Medicine Collections, which is maintained by my colleague Crystal Smith. And what we do here is that Crystal collects information from medical history of medicine collections in the United States and around the world. And basically, it will tell you what they've got, who's running the place, and a link to their database. Or I just say their, their web page. And we also have got the History of Medicine Finding Aids Consortium. So archivists don't catalog things. Archivists arrange them and describe them and then write a finding aid. Because by definition, any manuscript collection, archival collection of that sort is unique. For example, the papers of the Medical Library Association are stored at NLM. So the Finding Aids Consortium links you to finding aids at other institutions that do history of medicine collecting. So you can find your way more quickly to see who's got what. And some finding aids for big collections can be extremely detailed. And of course, we've digitized a bunch of collections. I didn't have the time to include that in here today. But um, if you're looking, if you have a patron that's looking for original materials, you know, the, the papers of the famous scientist, the papers of, of an organization, the consortium will help you. <coughs> and again, this is not just us, OK? At the moment, there are 11,000 finding aids for more than 100 special collections and archival repositories throughout the United States. And finally, kind of the, you know, the, the holy grail of all this is the Medical Heritage Library. Now, MHL is not an NLM function, though we are one of its founding members. And basically, it's a whole bunch of libraries, mostly in the US, Canada, and Britain, who are scanning their materials and making it publicly available for free and findable because it's they restore the stuff in the internet archive. So if you're looking for a 17th century medical book and you want to know, has it been scanned? If you go to our website and you look at the Locator Plus catalog record, you'll see a link. But if you go to MHL, you'll see all the copies all over the world. And again, MHL's uh, had to slow down some of this operation because of COVID, but it's an ongoing operation and one that um, we're very pleased with. This is what we've been hoping for for years. I mean, and to use their own you know, little subhead here, access to seven centuries of medical history in original format. And again, if you've ever worked with the Internet Archive, you know they're PDFs, they're downloadable, and they're just great. So here's that link summary that I mentioned earlier to all the important stuff. And again, the slides will be available. And um, I have left us time for questions. So thank you all for listening. Um, and by the way, there's my email down there. You can always write to me as well. Stephen, this is Dana. Um, a question from Louise. What type of book scanner do you use? Or maybe book scanners? Yeah, um, we've got a bunch. Uh, most of them are, um, are German. And um, 
Oh, gosh. Um, I guess we've got a half a dozen of them at the moment, depending on the size. Um, mostly they're the cradle scanners, okay, where the book can sit in the cradle and they're open about 90 degrees and then the camera shoots inside. Uh, for things that are oversized, um, we have, you know, flat scanners, but, you know, Kirtas scanners a lot, um, things of that sort. Uh, we shoot really, really, really high res so we don't have to do it again. And we have experimented over the years with sending less fragile materials off-site and having it sca um, scanned by contract, but we are not always happy about the quality control, um, plus the safety of the books. You know. I was showing you books from the, you know, the 15th and 16th century. You know, they're um, a lot sturdier than a medical journal from the 1920s. So it's kind of weird. Um, generally speaking, the scanners are owned by the library, but the people that actually use them are contractors because that's us. So there's a whole lot of them. Okay, Stephen, another question from Gail Kwame. Hey, Gail. Um, in how many languages should a history of medicine librarian be proficient? One. Okay. Okay. So you, all right. That, that was the, okay, let me explain. All right. Um, if you're a cataloger, then you might need some more languages. Okay, but by and large, as a librarian, um, you know, if you're just doing the research work, there are a couple of books that, and a couple of websites that teach you the um, the bookish kind of terms in different languages, so you know, you know, volume, edition, that kind of thing. But um, I've been doing this for a long time. You know, English is the only language I'm really fluent in. Theoretically, I can read French and German, but, like, don't wait up. Or I can do a title page in 15 languages if I, um, you know, if I've got the Internet handy. You know, Google Translate is never perfect, but it gives you a running start. And one thing that NLM does not do is we don't translate except the title. So I would say, really, it's a question of a specialization, okay? If you want to be um, a cataloger of rare Western books before 1700, Latin is nice. Greek is nice. But, um, you know, it's like how many languages should any cataloger be proficient in? Thanks, Stephen. Um, I have a question for you. Sure. So you never know when a collection might come your way. And I'm wondering, uh, one, how you find out about collections like your postcard collection that you talked about. And how do you plan financially? Because um, you never know what might be coming up. There might be something great. And um, how do you plan for that? OK. So um, let me divide things into three categories. Okay. There are manuscript collections, the papers of individuals. Then you've got some kind of cool um, postcard or um, painting or something. And then you have rare books. So let's do the easy one first. Generally speaking, the library does not purchase manuscript collections. The papers are given to us. So the Medical Library Association papers were just given to us on an understanding that we would take care of them. Um, C. Everett Coombs papers are with us. Marshall Nuremberg's papers are with us. They were donations to the library. Now, you do have to go through the minuet of having them appraised, not because we're paying anybody money, but if you make a donation to the federal government, you have a tax write-off. 
And one of the amusing moments, um, I was only tangentially involved in this, was appraising the market value for tax purposes of Marshall Nuremberg's Nobel Prize medal. That was kind of a hoot. Um, Louis Sullivan's papers, the first African-American Secretary of Health and Human Services, um, his papers just came to us. Um, you know, they were, they were a donation. And I guess most famously, we have Michael DeBakey's papers. Now, Michael DeBakey is special because Michael DeBakey's papers not only came to us, but they came to us with money. So we were able to, um, with money from the DeBakey Foundation, we were able to establish a DeBakey Fellowship where we have scholars who come to us every year to do research. And for those of you who know the nice use of the federal government, this is advertised on our web page, but the money is actually um, administered by the Foundation for Advanced Education in the Sciences, FAES. Okay. And we have all sorts of people coming for that. So that's one thing. Um, individual artifacts like this Wordling collection, um, he actually approached us to sell that. Um, and then you, you find things that are kind of like interesting and odd. So some of you may be familiar with the fact that Topps, the, base, uh, the baseball card people, issued a special Tony Fauci baseball card of him throwing out the first pitch. And we said, we got to have that for the collection. So we, we got that. As far as the books are concerned, and the, the main thing, um, MLM has an acquisitions budget. And that budget has a particular allocation for rare medical books. And um, I have in my section um, the most wonderful acquisitions librarian who has built up a network over the years of booksellers who specialize in history of medicine and history of the health sciences and kind of like um, sort of almost like STEM stuff. And they know what we've got because it's all in Locator Plus, and they know what we want because we've got a collection development policy. So people will say to us, hey, are you interested in this? And then we simply go through um, the purchase. Um, it's a matter of public record. If it's a certain you know, amount of money or higher, it's got to be listed in you know, the Federal Biz Ops directory. So people could theoretically compete. Though, of course, for the 15th century book, like, hey, buy my copy. It's better. That doesn't happen very often. But um, it's an ongoing process. And you know, there are a couple of, of buyers, you know, of booksellers, who just see something and go like, oh, NLM's going to want that. And sometimes we have to, like any other, you know, any other budget, you have to kind of play back and forth with, um, can I buy it this year? Can you hold it till next year? And um, the, <coughs> excuse me, the articello that I showed you earlier, we purchased that during COVID times, OK? Um, and that was an adventure because we had to arrange for someone to be at the library to receive the book when it arrived, because that was worth um, some change. Okay, we don't throw dollar figures around because it's kind of weird. Um, you know, the collection is not insured because we're the government, and we don't appraise things, generally speaking, unless someone needs it either for tax purposes or if we if we loan something to another um, institution, then it needs to be appraised, and then they have to pay the insurance. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. I just imagined you up like at 2 in the morning combing through eBay or something. Well, you know something? <laughs> we, have, we have purchased things through eBay from time to time. Um, usually it's ephemeral stuff. Um, I think that's how we ended up getting the baseball card. Okay. But um, I'm too old to stay up at 2 o'clock in the morning going through eBay. <laughs> All right, um, a question for Maria. Let's see, let me scroll back up a little second here. Um, she asks, what 
uh, do you have a resource you can recommend as a reference of uh, bookish terms that might be available in multiple languages? Yes, hold on one second. Let me get my copy so I can read it to you. I'm afraid I have no idea if this is still in print, but the book is called A Manual of European Languages for Librarians. The editor is C.G. Allen, A-L-L-E-N, and it was published by Bowker. Um, but you know, Google Translate doesn't do such a terrible job either. Okay, thank you. And of course, the other thing that you can always do is drop us an email and we can help. Um, you know, on the NLM website, there's a contact us link at the bottom of every page. But here's the trick. Don't go to one of the pre-selected categories on the left. Go to the Right to a Librarian box in the upper right. That gets to us much much faster because AI isn't always as fast as you would want it to be. But, you know, for better or for worse, we're still answering questions and we can help. All right. Um, we have time for one last question. And I apologize to Stephen and to everybody who joined. The beeping was completely my fault. I just did not. Um, in after deactivate something in the settings. So I really apologize for that. And I thank Stephen for just I'm, I'm kind of used working to that. through it. No, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of used to that. People are going kind of like that. rain or something. Yeah, rain or thunder. It's okay. All right. Um, and maybe I just have one last question for you, Stephen. You mentioned that um, you know because of COVID, one of the things you weren't doing was scanning. But was there anything maybe that came out of COVID um, that a change in practice that, that you think will continue post-pandemic, that it really turned out like, you know, we hadn't thought about doing it this way, and now we can continue doing it this way? Um, huh. You're going to get me in trouble. Um, so here's the thing. We were planning on renovating the library long before this all happened. And now we are doing what the library calls maximum telework, which means that if you can work from home, you're working from home. I average one half day per month on site at the library. Some of the people in my section have not been on site at all. And when you're renovating a library building like ours, where, you know, you've got one deck of cards and you can only shuffle them so many ways, and we're beginning to think about um, more, to use a word that I really don't like because it's not really a word, hoteling, where people do most of their work from home and come occasionally and say hi, and they don't have a permanent desk, so they just bring in their laptop and plug it in wherever there's a chair. So I think the number of people on site at the library at any given moment will change. But once they let us do this, um, and by, I mean go back on a regular basis, I think there'll be far fewer people working in the library. And this is not unique to the history of medicine. But I, I do say and this goes you know, to the very, very highest levels of what we do. The library is committed to providing public services when public services is the best way of getting patrons what they need. I cannot wait until I can put real books in the hands of real people so they can see real stuff. Um, the picture that you're seeing of that, that book with the really crazy binding and the straps, Okay, you're seeing it from the edge. That's a real book in our collection. It's um, it's a 14th century binding, 
though the leather's been strengthened. No amount of scanning gives you the same understanding of what the book physically is. You have to hold it. And that's, that's why I put in that rather scary picture of the, um, you know, of the obstetrical text, okay? You don't realize what's going on with that book until it's in, in front of you. I mean, yeah, you know, you look at our charts and it's just like, okay, you see the book you're seeing on your screen? It's actually 22 inches high. That's not the same as having the book in front of you. So some things will change, some things will not. And all of the plans for the library, even as they change a little bit, include a public space for readers to come when we're allowed to do that and have real people put real books in front of them. That's an ongoing commitment, and that will not change. That was a long answer. No, it was a great answer. And I look forward to the day that I can get back on the um, NLM campus. And Stephen, I want to thank you again for joining us. I've learned so much about these beautiful collections that um, you have and are the caretaker of. And I appreciate everyone coming today. Um, just as a reminder, we will be posting um, Steve's PowerPoint slides and video on the training page. So um, be looking out for those. And I hope you all have a great day. And thanks again, Stephen. It was really wonderful to hear. Thanks to everyone for coming.